Um, before I start talking about Kanban, I have to talk about uh, Waterfall. So let's just do uh, a quick introduction to Waterfall. This is a deck um, that I came up with after getting together with all the other rally coaches. We get together two or three times a year and share our experiences and uh, share our learnings and brainstorm some ideas. Uh, and this came out of a, a discussion we had around uh, what if our one of our customers said, could you teach us waterfall? So this is the deck we came up with. <laughs> no. Uh, we figured we could scale this and we could probably just stand there all day just saying no. But, you know, just one slide's a bit boring. Um, we wanted to uh, internationalize this. Anybody speak French in the audience? <laughs> no. Uh, I'm going to go to Germany soon, so we've got a German slide. Uh, some people prefer white text on a black background. Um, some people still like comic, comic sans serif font. Um, if you're into agile, uh, Zen, presentation Zen, and you like images, we can do it that way. Uh, <laughs> I like that as well. Um, and then let's see if this... always no if they say no it means a thousand times no <laughs> join in when you know the words no plus no equals no all no's lead to no, no, no. okay we're short of time so uh i won't make you sit through that all right, back to the main content. Um, the reason I start with that is I actually used to do that when I started consulting Agile, but the other way around is I'd go into organizations that were doing waterfall, and I, well, I know I did used to do that, and I'd just say, no, you don't want to do it like that. You want to do it like this. And then over the years, I've realized that um, it works a lot of the time, but it doesn't work a lot of the time as well, and sometimes organizations need to figure these things out to themselves. And then I got into Kanban about 2007, and that gave me a different way of thinking about it. So while I think um, some of it, well, it's not common sense, is it? We know that Lean and Agile isn't common sense. That's why we can't just go in and say, no, don't do that, do this. On the other hand, common sense is a heuristic. It's, it's a heuristic that doesn't always work. Um, there's the well-known phrase, common sense isn't that common. But when we're trying to solve a problem and we're going to deal with challenges that we've not come across before, what we tend to do is apply common sense, do the thing we think is the right thing to do. So I'm going to talk about Kanban in terms of heuristics. That's really the focus of this. Um, what I'm not going to do is talk about this, which is the Kanban method. So this is what David Anderson came up with. Um, this is his way of doing things. I've gone in a slightly different direction than him, although the way he describes it, the way I'm going to describe it, are completely compatible, I think. The other thing I should warn you about is that I'm not going to give you any answers today. If you're coming in here wanting to know, I want to know how to do Kanban, I'm not going to be able to do that. What I'm going to do is give you some things to think about and some questions to maybe take back and, and ask yourself or ask your colleagues, or ask the organizations you're working for or working with to try and help them solve their own problems. So for me, Kanban isn't a way of having a coming up with a, or, or being a solution. It's a way of helping people come up with their own solutions. So it's about developing problem solvers rather than being a solution in itself. So this is what I call Kanban thinking. And you'll see the heuristics on the left-hand side Study, share, contain, sense, explore. These are the, the five almost uh, categories, things I think about when I'm working with organizations and trying to help them understand how they can design a Kanban system. Every Kanban system is going to be unique. Uh, I'd also say every Kanban system is wrong because they're constantly evolving. Um, and then if, if you anybody just came out of Ken's talk. So Ken was very much talking about measuring measuring at the start, measuring the end, uh, and that's what the impacts are. So measuring impact, understanding the impact that the Kanban system is having, and I talk about those in terms of flow, value, and potential. Uh, flow is how well is the work flowing, how well are we progressing the work. It tends to be about the process, 
value is more about the work that we're doing. We could have really good flow, but we could still deliver a lot of crap. So we want to be delivering value as work. So is our Kanban system helping us to deliver more value? And then is our Kanban system, Kanban system helping to create more potential? Business potential, organizational potential, potential for our customers, and probably most importantly, is it enriching human potential? So potential is really about the sustainability of the system. If the system has no potential for the future, then it's just going to solve today's problems. Today's problems are going to change, and we're back to square one. We're going to focus on the heuristics today. And I've come across these heuristics, or came to the, the conclusion that heuristics was the right word, because I stumbled on it about three times, really. So I'm going to just talk through those three sources of inspiration for why I think heuristics is, is the right concept and the right approach to be taking. Then we'll go into a little bit more detail about what I mean by study, share, contain, sense, explore as heuristics. So here's the definition of heuristic. And if we look at that, I think it ties really well into what, certainly what I do and I think we all do when we're trying to help organizations become more lean and become more agile. We're trying to help them to learn. We're trying to help them to discover, discover the better ways of working, we're trying to solve their problems and particularly through experimenting. Lean startup is a little bit like experimenting. You're running lots of experiments. Um, plan, do, study, act. The Deming cycle is an experimentation cycle. Um, but you're using trial and error. There's no guaranteed solution. We'll just have to try things out, see what works, find the stuff that does work and do more of it, and find the stuff that doesn't work and do less of it. Sounds a bit like a retrospective. Um, that problem solving is exploratory. Um, self-evaluating techniques, and the last bit, um, feedback cycles. We talk about feedback cycles in Lean and Agile a lot, and improving performance. So there's a lot of concepts, a lot of words in there that I think just tie perfectly into what we do when we're trying to help organizations improve. But we're doing it through heuristics. We're not coming in with an answer. So the first concept is that heuristics replace rules. But when we know what the answer is, we can build some rules around that, we can build best practice around it, and we can just say, follow the rules, follow best practice. But when we're in complex situations where we don't know what the answer is, we need to stop using the rules and start using heuristics. So this is an idea that um, I picked up from Dave Snowden uh, and his Kinevin model. Anybody familiar with Kinevin? All right, um, I could probably talk about this slide all day, so I'm going to try and run through it really, really quickly. Um, essentially, you have on the far side, you have the ordered domains, and on this side, you have the... If I do it that way, it's not going to work, is it? Order domains and unordered domains, if I look at this slide. Um, the order domains are when we can start using rules and best practice and good practice, and we know what's going on. But when we start getting into the complex space, we're now unordered. And the key thing there is about cause and effect. When you're ordered, there's some sort of repeatable, knowable cause and effect. So we know that if we do this practice, we will get this result. But quite often, when we're in the complex space, complex space, it's more about retrospective causality. We can look back and say, we, when we can see that a practice resulted in some kind of impact, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen ag again. So we talk more about emergent practice and discovering what those practices are by interacting with the system. So the probe sense respond means we, we probe, we run experiments, we interact with the system and we see what works. We sense what works and then we respond to that by doing more of it and do less of it. This is on the other side when you have either sense, analyze, respond or sense, categorize, respond, where you can just look at the results, figure out what the right thing to do is and do it. Um, the chaotic domain is probably something you, you just, that's just a trans transitory domain. You don't want to be in there too often. So what Dave said is when you're in the complex space, you need to use heuristics and not rules. So here's a little quote on that from one of his blogs. Um, and it's kind of nice, it's a bit of a recursive quote. We need a clear rule for when or who we can break the rules and heuristics apply to the other side of the boundary. So when you can't use rules, you need to use heuristics. If you have to break the rules, then it's okay. But then you need to follow the heuristics. If you just not using rules and just trying things out randomly, you're probably not going to get results at all. There's a nice example that Dave uses for heuristics, um, which is from the Marines. So the Marines have heuristics when they're going into battle. Because they go in a plan, 
and then as soon as you make contact with the enemy, the plan all falls apart, so then they're going to move into heuristics. Take the high ground, stay in touch, keep moving. They're the three mari marine heuristics. And from those heuristics, they can figure out, in an unexpected scenario, in an ex ex unexpected battle, they can figure out what the right thing to have it to try and do it. Uh, and this is just Dave's heuristics. He's got his own three heuristics for complexity, distributed cognition, disintermediation, and finely grained object objects. Distributed con di cognition is the idea that everybody has a little bit of the answer. And if we can get everybody together and get all that knowledge together, then we're more likely to come up with a good answer rather than having silos and different people knowing um, the right answer themselves. Disintermediation is about putting the users of the data directly in front of the data itself and not having kind of lots of reports in between. Uh, and then finely grained object, lots of little building blocks, and we build solutions from the little building blocks. Uh, distributed cognition is why we have um, co-located teams and we have cross-functional teams. Disintermediation is why we want to get the software in front of the customer and get, get access to that, that direct data and uh, incremental software. Finely grained objects is why we break things down into small user stories. So we can look at those heuristics and understand some of our agile practices in terms of those heuristics. Right, the next uh, idea is that heuristics support substitution. So when we're using heuristics, this is the idea that what we're using those heuristics to do is take a difficult question and substitute an easier question. And we should then be able to answer the easy question. So this notion I picked up from Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow. Anyone read this? I know Mary and Tom have. Uh, it's, a, it's a really good book. It's quite a kind of long, detailed read, but uh, I thoroughly recommend it. Um, so he, he has this definition of heuristics, a simple procedure that helps find adequate, though often imperfect, answers to difficult questions. And the word comes from the same root as Eureka. Key thing there is uh, adequate, though often imperfect. So we might come up with things that are not perfect. Sometimes they might even be wrong. And we'll, we'll show you an example of that soon. Um, the other thing like there is the idea that it comes from Eureka. Nobody has a Eureka moment about something they already knew. But generally, we're trying to do things we've never done before, we're trying to solve problems we've not solved before. We need to have that eureka moment, so we use heuristics. So he's Kahneman says that we have some, some heuristics that we use when we're making decisions. This book is all about the way we make decisions. Um, and that we use, as I said, we use these heuristics to substitute difficult questions um, into easier questions to answer. So there's an example of that. Let's try this out. Consider the letter K. Is K more likely to appear as the first letter in a word or as the third letter in a word? So hands up if you think. So first of all, before you answer this question, try and answer it honestly. Generally, when I do this, people are trying to second guess it because they know it's a trick question. So try and answer it honestly. How many hands up if you think that it's the uh, K is more likely to appear as the first letter of a word? Okay, and hands up if you think it's more likely to be the third letter of the word. All right, a few more, I think, said it's the first letter of the word. It's actually, it's the second one. It's more likely to appear as the third letter of the word. Now, we don't know the statistical answer to that. I'm assuming nobody here, unless you've read the book, knows the statistical answer to that. So what we're doing is just substituting the question, that question for, how many words can I think of that begin with the letter K? Or how many words can I think of that have K as the third letter? And naturally, more words that begin with the letter K are available to our mind. So this is the availability heuristic. When we're answering tricky questions, we answer it with the answers that are more available, mo mo the things that come to mind more easily. Now that's an example of where generally it can lead you down the wrong path. So this is the idea, it's not going to always give us the right answer. Um, there's another one. Uh, an individual has been described by a neighbour as follows. Steve is very shy and withdrawn. I can't quite read it for me. Invariably helpful, but with little interest in people or in the world of reality. A meek and tidy soul. He has the need for order and structure and a passion for detail. Is Steve more likely to be a librarian or a farmer? Okay, answer, try and answer it honestly. Who thinks librarian? Okay, who thinks farmer? Okay, you've beaten me on that one. So normally people say librarian because they think that sounds like a librarian. Again, generally people don't know the statistical answer to that, which is that there are statistically more farmers than there are librarians. Therefore, statistically, Steve, it doesn't matter how I've described him, 
Statistically, Steve is more likely to be a farmer because there are more farmers than librarians. But what we do is we say, well, who does Steve sound more like? Sounds like a bit like a librarian. Therefore, I'm going to answer librarian. So it's that re that's called the representative heuristic. So we're taking these things and substituting difficult questions into easy questions to help us answer the answer these tricky things. All right, the third one, just check on time, is uh, heuristics guide us towards new possibilities. So we have these challenges, these problems that we're trying to solve. We don't know what the answer is, but we need something to guide us towards what the possible answers might be. And this comes from another book, Design of Business by Roger Martin. Anybody read this one? Okay, Tom and Mary, you're not counted in this. You've read everything. Um, another really good book. Um, uh, it's, it's more a design thinking, applying design thinking to, to business design. And his definition of heuristic is a rule of thumb that guides us towards a solution by way of organized exploration of the possibilities. It's that organized exploration bit that's the key thing that I pull out of that. When we're applying heuristics, we're not doing things randomly. And we're not just ignoring the exp our experience of the past. We're using our, our experience of the past to inform our heuristics, to try and guide us. So we're not just kind of just scat doing a scattergun thing. We are trying to do things intentionally with an idea and a hypothesis of what might work. Um, but there are many possible answers. And Roger Martin uses this in what he calls the knowledge funnel. So when we were acquiring knowledge, we start off with lots of mysteries and there's lots of data out there. And we're trying to solve those mysteries by making sense of that, all that data. And we use heuristics to start make, making sense of that. And particularly once we have experience of dealing with those mysteries, then we use those heuristics based on those experiences. And then we drive that knowledge from mystery through heuristics down into algorithm. And once we're down at algorithm, it means we've, we've solved this. Uh, Roger Martin uses McDonald's as, an as, as, a, as a good example of this. So McDonald's started out with a couple of brothers um, in the 20s or 30s, I think. I don't remember the details. And they were trying to, trying to solve the mystery of what a families want to eat when they go out. When they go out for a drive and they're trying to find something to eat, what do, they, what do they want? And they started playing around and they came up with some heuristics around fast food and kind of simple, consistent uh, menus. And then over the time, uh, they, they got bought out and that got driven down to the heuristic that we know is McDonald's today, to the point at which the, the algorithm, sorry, the algorithm that we know is McDonald's today, to the point at which they have rules around you know, how long you cook the patty on each side and exactly how much lettuce to put in the bun and things like that. It's really driven down to the algorithm. Now, the other learning from McDonald's then is that that algorithm is based on past experience. An algorithm is based on the past and the future is likely to be different. So that's where the validity and reliability on the other side come into it. When we're up in the mystery space, we're trying to come up with a valid solution to the problem. But it's not reliable because we're really trying things out. As we drive the knowledge down, using heuristics down to algorithm, we're coming up with a reliable algorithm that we know is going to work repeatably. But as context and the situation changes, the chances are that that algorithm that was reliable suddenly proves not to be reliable because it's no longer valid. So there's a story about uh, the chicken and the farmer was coming to the chicken and feeding it every day. So the chicken kind of drove that knowledge from mystery down to heuristic to the algorithm, which is when the farmer turns up, I get fed. And day after day, that proved to be a really reliable algorithm. But it turned out it wasn't a valid algorithm, which the chicken found out when the farmer turned up one day with the axe. And the chicken wasn't being fed, the chicken was being the food. So situations change. We need to revisit our algorithms and actually then, so it's the, the knowledge doesn't just go down the funnel, we have to go back up the funnel. So McDonald's experienced this because um, KFC and Subways, uh, Subways I think is the particularly the example that Roger Martin uses came in with. They solved the same mystery with some slightly different heuristics and came up with a different algorithm. And suddenly people started preferring the Subways algorithm to the McDonald's algorithm. So McDonald's had to kind of go back and revisit their heuristics and try and come up with some healthy food and by that point they're too late. So that's the knowledge funnel. Um, and the other thing related to that then is the different types of logic that we use. So because we're trying to solve problems that haven't been solved before, we have to use abductive logic. 
But if we start with inductive logic and take the 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 um, the idea of the black swan, if people are familiar with the black swan notion. Um, so if I've never seen a black swan, when I see a white swan, I can use inductive logic. Sorry, a white bird. I can use inductive logic to say that's likely to be a swan because I've only ever seen white swans. So that's inductive, the logic of what is. If I then see a black bird that looks like a swan, what I'm probably going to say is that must not be a swan. So I'm now using dedu deductive logic to deduce that that's probably not a swan. But if I use abductive logic, which is the logic of what might be, I can say, well, it's plausible that there could be black swans, and therefore this might be a swan. But the thing with abductive logic is that you can't, abductive logic says you can't prove anything based on past data because it's never happened in the past. So if we're using heuristics and trying to solve problems that may not have been solved in the past, it means we have to use abductive logic to try and figure out what the solutions are. We need to talk about what might be rather than what must be or what is. So there's a different way of thinking about things. All right, so back to these heuristics. Uh, so I'm now going to drill down into the uh, study, share, contain, sense, explore, and actually kind of just expand these out a little bit. So study, I'm talking about studying the context, studying the current situation that you're in to get understanding, then sharing that understanding and making sure everybody has a common understanding, containing the work, so starting to put some boundaries in place, some constraints in place, which help us manage the system. Sensing the capability of the system, so how well is the system currently performing? What impact is the system currently having? And then starting to explore the potential of the system. Starting to run some experiments. Starting to use abductive logic to figure out what things could we do differently. So I'm going to just run through these um, and just kind of drill them into a little bit more detail. Before I do that, have a little think about a mystery, a problem that you're trying to solve at work at the moment. And then have that in mind. Actually, before we do that, have a think about a problem you solve and maybe turn to the person next to you and share that with them. And then when I run through these five heuristics, I want you to be thinking around how would I use these questions, these heuristics, to solve my problem or maybe solve the, the problem that the person next to me has just talked about. So spend a few minutes, think about a mystery that you, you, you're trying to solve and share it with the person next to you while I take some water. Okay, everybody done that? Right, does somebody want to share the, the, the mystery that they have? Anybody want to share? Okay, remember there's an incentive. Yeah, what mystery are you gonna, you, do you want to solve? Okay, how do you establish work in progress limits? All right, thank you very much. You get the book. All right, so if you didn't have a mystery, you could maybe just think about that one. Otherwise, think about the mystery that you came up with or maybe think about the, the mystery that the person next to you shared with you. Using these heuristics, again, instead of just using rules, instead of using best practice, using them to come up with some substituting questions that you could ask about the problem and the mystery, and then using that to figure out what possible things might you try to do things differently. All right, we'll start with shutting the contrast. So this is, this is questions about who is my customer? What is the customer's purpose? Do I have empathy with that customer and how could I have empathy with that customer? What are the different types of work that we're doing? What are the different types of demand that we have from those customers? Maybe the different costs of delay for that, those different types of work. How does that work flow through our system? How does it transform as it flows through the system? And particularly, how does the knowledge transform as it flows through the system? How do we, how do we learn about the work as it flows through the system? Maybe what artifacts do we use? 
Um, there's a couple of things that I, I didn't put on there as well. Is what, where are the feedback loops? Where do we get feedback on the work as we're doing it? Where do we have to make decisions on the work as we're doing it? Questions to start like that, to start understanding your context. And that might lead to, so there's, there's a load of great load of techniques in design thinking around getting customer empathy. There's a nice ideas around demand analysis that you could link into. Um, and particularly the notion of value demand versus failure demand. What if type of your demand is really adding value? What if your demand is because you didn't do something right and you could have, or you didn't do something at all in the first place? So failure demand is demand you want to eliminate. Uh, looking at the flow and the transformations is starting to take some ideas from value stream mapping and looking at your processes and understanding that. So studying the context is about asking you asking yourself questions around the way things are now. Your customer, the way, the work, and the way that you do the work. Sharing the understanding. So what are the important dimensions that we want to share? Are we interested in the type of work? Are we interested in dependencies? Are we interested in how long the work's taking? Are we interested in um, how big the work is? Are we interested in uh, where the risks are? So there's a whole load of different dimensions of the, the, the work that we're doing. And we can't share all of it. So which are the important things that we want to share and we want to make sure everybody's um, aware of? Does everybody have a common model? So we take that understanding and we're essentially creating a common mental model. Does everybody have that same mental model of the, the work, our customers, the way we do the work, the way we bro break down the work, the, wo the way we talk about the work? And if we have a common model, how can we visualize that? How can we help everybody see the work? Um, and then the, the token inscription placement uh, is, a, is a little sub heuristic I use in terms of what, how can we use tokens? How can we use cards, index cards, post-it notes to represent the work? How can we inscribe information on those cards to help convey the important information and the important dimensions? How can we use placement of those tokens Horizontal, vertical, relationship, uh, you know, relational. Again, different ways of conveying information. So those are the way when I'm trying to help teams come up with ways of visualizing the work and coming up with Kanban boards, those are three little things that I think about. How do you use the tokens? How do you use the information that you write on the tokens? How do you use the placement of those tokens to convey the information, the Im those important dimensions to create that common visual model? Containing the work. Uh, I used to talk about limiting the work, and then uh, I think work in process limits are just one. They're just one type of policy. So we do want to look at how much work we have in process, how much work we want to have in process. Where can we limit the work in process? Where is the too much work in process? So questions around work in process, and then questions around other types of policies. What other ex explicit policies do we have? Do we want to make? Or do we want to put in place? And those might be policies which either might, they might be existing policies that cause delays. What, what kind of, what kind of current process rules do we have which are current, is currently delaying the work? Or resulting in low quality or resulting in lots of rework? And then how might you change the policies to reduce delays, to improve quality, to reduce the amount of rework? Policies are things like your definition of done. Definition of done is a policy to say this work is done when we've done all these things. Again, definition of ready is a is a set of criteria around the quality of work. So looking at questions around the policies you have and uh, working process limits are just a special type of policy to help you contain the work. Put some boundaries around the system, put some constraints in place. Uh, if we re refer back to Dave Snowden's work with his complexity work, what he would say was, um, if you have no constraints, you have chaos. So when we're working in chaotic organizations, it may be that we just have don't no have we have no policies, or everybody has their own personal set of policies. There's no shared policies, or you get the other extreme where the work the policies are too constrained, and if you have uh, too much constraint, you then have a very brittle system, and then the system breaks, and then you're back into chaos. So we want some constraints but loose constraints, and constraints that we can change and evolve over time as we learn. 
So those constraints are effectively the way we create this container which we we have the system in. And then sensing the capability. So this is ties back to impact, particularly. What's our flow capability? What's our value capability? What's our potential capability? How well is the work flowing? How much value are we delivering? How are we going to keep delivering value and keep our flow going forward? And then drilling down into that a little bit more detail, getting into maybe some more specific measures that we might want to put in place around productivity, how productive we are, how much work are we delivering? That might be throughput. How responsive are we? So what's our lead time? How quickly can we deliver things when the business asks for it? How predictable are we? When we say we're going to deliver something, how often do we actually deliver to that date? Um, that might be due date performance. You might be just looking at the variability of your lead time. How do we measure quality? How do we know how, how good the work we're doing is? Defects or it might be customer support calls. Employee satisfaction and customer satisfaction. Um, particularly employee satisfaction, I think, is a really a, a key measure of potential. Uh, if you have very low employee satisfaction, you're going to get high turnover. You're going to have to start retraining people. Your organization has no potential, and you're not really investing in your human potential, the human potential. And then we also sense capability through the cadences that we have. And the cadences are really these interaction points that we have with the system. So how often do we do prioritization? How often do we do queue replenishment? How often do we do retrospectives? How often do we do reviews? How often do we release? How often do we go and talk to our customers? These are all different cadences, different regular ways that we can start interacting with the system and then understanding the system's capability through that. And then the last one is exploring the potential of the system. So how can we make more impact? How can we change the system so that it gets better? So that we have more impact, we deliver more flow value, we increase our flow, we maximize the potential. And that leads to questions around what's working well, what things do we want to do more of? From a, a complexity point of view, what things do we amplify? And then what things aren't working well and what things we want to do less of, which things do we want to dampen down? What experiments do we want to run? So if we're using abductive logic and come up with coming up with new ideas, when we don't know whether those ideas are going to work, we want to run some really small experiments. Intentional experiments that say, if we try to make these policy changes, if we change these constraints to our system, we think we'll deliver more value, or we think we'll, our flow will improve. So experiments with measurable results. So we're really starting to get into a scientific mindset in order to improve our system. And some of the lean startup ideas can come in useful there as well. Um, so hopefully, that's kind of a, a really high level through. As I said, I've not given you any answers there. I've not told you what to do, other than start asking yourself some questions to help you understand your system at the moment. Um, and I call this Kanban thinking and Kanban systems actually the, the Kanban bit of it is a really minimal bit of it now, which is the limiting working process. To me, it's more about looking at our processes, our organizations as systems and looking at we can how we can evolve and improve those processes, those systems. Um, so three takeaways, three recommendations would be um, to avoid blindly following rules. So don't just follow a process because um, somebody suggested you do it. Maybe take ideas from those processes and, and use them to inform your experiments, but don't just blindly follow them. Start substituting these Kanban heuristics. So when you're trying to solve your problems, again, instead of following a rule, use the heuristics to come up with some ideas and then start embracing abductive logic to start coming up with some ideas. Maybe try some crazy things. Um, and Dave Snowden would say, actually, if you're running experiments, you run multiple experiments and you run multiple competing experiments. So you run a couple of experiments where you know that they can't both succeed. Or they're, they're, they're both not going to prove your hypothesis because they're actually competing hypotheses. And the end result, really, and this is the impact side of things, is we're trying to balance validity and reliability. We want our, to have businesses to have valid solutions. There's no good in, in having reliable solutions if they're no longer valid. So we're trying to kind of keep that tension between the two and always have humanity at the bottom. So I relate the value, the value impact is really looking for validity, 
the flow impact is really looking for reliability and building potential is all about humanity for me. I'll close with just another little metaphor. Um, I don't think you have Strictly Come Dancing in America. I think you call it Dancing with the Stars. Ah. Uh, I have to confess, uh, I do enjoy this show. Anybody, anybody wanna? Yes, I enjoy Dancing with the Stars. Okay, good, good. I'm not the only one. Um, it, it's just about to restart in the UK. Very excited about it. Um, if we take this idea of heuristics and the idea that it, it guides you towards um, coming up with a, an algorithm, but it doesn't tell you what to do. I think dancing styles could be thought of as heuristics. So if you're dancing the cha-cha-cha, or the tango, it doesn't tell you what steps to do, but you could think of it as a set of heuristics with which you can come up with your tango or your cha-cha-cha. Uh, I'm not a dancer, but I've asked this question, and I've nobody's told me that this is a fundamentally flawed analogy yet. Um, and it's not a serious one. The main reason for that analogy is that if we can use the dancing analogy and the dance style analogy, we can think of Kanban as a type of dance, which means we can talk about Kanban style. Now, <laughs> I'm not going to play the video for that. I just want to close that. Just as a, just a little, hopefully that'll get into your head. I do have a video, but um, we don't have good audio here. All right. Um, so I hope that was uh, got you thinking, as I said. Uh, no answers in there, but hopefully kind of gave you some things to think about. And I think we have some time for questions. So does anybody does anybody have any questions or does anybody who want to share any thoughts or insights they had from thinking about those heuristics and, uh, and applying them to the, the mystery that they were trying to solve? Yes, yeah. Um, we, we talk about self-organizing teams, but if teams are too self-organizing because they have no constraints, then it's just chaos, yeah. So we need to have, so a lot of our, po our processes are effectively policies to, to avoid that chaos. Yes, and maybe running some experiments around your definition of done. What will happen if we change our definition? So that might be a type of experiment that we think if we add this to it, if we add a, 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 um, a another testing type to our definition of done, that we think our quality will go up and we think our lead time will go down. I would I, I would probably have a conversation around that, but actually my my attitude nowadays is to say, okay, let's try it. I, I might be pretty confident that um of the result that experiment would show, but again going right back to the, the original waterfall, I very rarely go in and say, No, that's a really bad idea now. I'll go in and talk about what the consequences of that decision might be. But if if people really want to try it, I'll say, Okay, let's try it. How are we gonna know? whether it's the right thing to do. So that leads back to, so why do we think having no working process limits is gonna be a good thing? Now, presumably it's because we think if we start more work, we'll get more work done. Okay, so we think our productivity is gonna go up. All right, what's our current productivity? What's our, in terms of sensing our capability? And we're gonna run an experiment to explore the potential of not having working process limits and see what the impact that will have on our productivity. And my guess would that it'd be get worse, but, it depends on what your working process is, because a working process limit of one can be too small sometimes. So there is a sweet spot. Um, but I, I mean, that's a common experiment type to run is maybe not having no working process limits, but increasing it or decreasing it.
Yeah, then then um, so what you're starting to talk about is is your current context. So you're st you're starting to kind of studying your context and looking at the type of skills you have and the the nature of the work and the the skills that that work requires. So I might want to start looking at how we can make sure that we have a common understanding of these. So effectively, you have a, a constraint in place. What's the impact of that, um, and how might we um, reduce the impact of that or have more impact? Yeah. Any more questions? All right, well, I think we're at time anyway. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>